Welcome to Family Comes First. I'm Vincent J. Russo. And I'm Victoria Roberts-Drogan. Thank you for joining us today. Vincent, in today's world, there's a stigma that the world of sports is closed to people with disabilities. But that is not the case. Absolutely not. There are many organizations that support athletes with disabilities, mm -hmm. such as USA Volleyball. Yeah. Today, we'll hear the story of Laura Webster, who won a gold medal in the 2016 Paralympic Games in Rio. Welcome to Family Comes First, Going for Gold. Today on Family Comes First, we're talking with Laura Webster, who was a gold medal winner in the 2016 Paralympic Games in Rio for sitting volleyball. Laura currently plays for USA Volleyball and was the keynote speaker for the athletes at the 2017 Nassau County Empire State Games for the Physically Challenged in New York. And we are so excited to have you here today. Thank Welcome. you very much. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you for having me. Yeah. Um, so tell us, Tell us about your life. Tell us how this started. I know you had a life-changing event at 11 years old. I did. When I was a kid, I was always that very stereotypical active kid. I was always outside, nonstop, playing every sport that I could. Mm. And after some knee pain that had been bothering me for a couple of months, we went to the doctor. And within five days, we were told that I had a tumor, I had a biopsy done, and then I was set up to start chemo, all within less than a week. Wow. And so it was wow. a lot to take in for our family. Your life was just upended and we didn't really have time to process everything, which kind of worked out to be good because we didn't have time to dwell on it. Okay. And immediately we were thrown in to getting past it, which was nice. We were on the path to getting past the, the cancer. Um, and in the middle of my chemo treatments, the doctors asked me what surgery that I wanted to have to get rid of the tumor and how I would live the rest of my life. And, and you're they an 11 year me, old. An 11 year old, yes. Having to struggle with a decision yes. like that. And so my they, parents they allowed you me options. to make the decision. Wow. They did, they gave me the option to be an above knee amputee mm -hmm. where they would amputate the leg from about mid thigh down and I would have a, a prosthetic with an artificial knee joint or they gave me the option to have a, um, an artificial knee joint put in where mm -hmm. cosmetically the leg would look the same but the function would not be the high impact ability that um, sports would require. And that mm -hmm. was something that I wanted to maintain in my life after cancer. Mm -hmm. And the third option was a surgery called rotation plasty in which they would take away the knee and the tumor and cut about mid shin and mid thigh and take that part of my leg out and then rotate the bottom part of my leg around 180 degrees mm -hmm. and connect it to the remaining part of the femur. So now my foot is on backwards, but my foot and my ankle joint would act as my new knee joint. So oh, I would wow. have full control over how my leg moved. So that gave you the most options as an athlete. It did for sure. Okay. And it allowed, there was no phantom pains that I would be feeling, um, which is something that a lot of amputees have to suffer through. Um, and I would be in control of how my body moved, which mm. is ultimately what would allow me to be successful at sports. Sounds like you were very fortunate to have both parents who allowed you to make this choice and doctors who explained to you what it would mean for you personally, because you're an athlete. Absolutely. It's just, it shines out of you, you know? <laughs> um, and this seems to be the most consistent with that, but at 11, that's wow. a huge it was. decision. Yeah. Um, to me, it was all about what was next. Mm. And there wasn't a lot of thought, my mom, struggled with me having a backwards foot because she always wondered how, as a young woman, I would fit that into a first date of, right. hey, <laughs> by the way, my foot's on backwards. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I wasn't thinking of at 11 years old. Right. And so I'm grateful that my mom had that side of my life yeah. in her mind. And that Moms was one of her concerns. see ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, you're I'm a mom very now, grateful so. for that, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but for me, I didn't care about cosmetics. It didn't matter to me. That was a hurdle that I would get to when I needed to. But anyone who was not willing to accept that was nobody that I wanted to be with anyways. Mm -hmm. And so this surgery allowed me to be active, not only as an athlete, but just as an everyday person. And mm -hmm. thankfully for me, and because of my surgery, when I put my prosthetic on in the morning and take it off at night, those are the only two times that I really have to think and remember that I mm. have a prosthetic. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't affect my daily life. Awesome. Right. Now, sports obviously has played a huge 
part of your life. Yes. So were you into sports? Uh, how young of a child were you into sports, and, and, and how did you get involved in volleyball? Was it always volleyball? It wasn't, no. Soccer mm. was my favorite. Okay. Um, Post-cancer, the running, mm. the constant running was mm. just something that I didn't, that wasn't in the cards for me. Right. Um, but I had a, my sister is six years older than me, and I grew up watching her play volleyball. That was her sport. Okay. And so after cancer, it just natu it was natural that I fell into it, and it was a sport that I felt like I could still play well at, mm -hmm. no matter what. Um, my leg didn't affect it, mm -hmm. and I felt like I could still contribute to the teams that I was a part of, and I hoped that I would improve myself as an athlete, right. not just somebody playing with a prosthetic, but actually an mm. athlete and somebody who contributes to the betterment of the team. Yeah. So tell us about sitting volleyball. This is, yeah. this is something different. Yes, it is, and something that I had no idea about, even though my life was volleyball. Right. Mm. Um, when I was in, I played after chemo, and after I got my prosthetic, I went playing in volleyball, both for middle school and high school. And it was during my high school, my, when I was my junior year, sophomore year, that I was playing at a club tournament in California where somebody approached my parents and said, we've noticed your daughter, and we were interested in wanting to know if she would want to come and explore the Paralympic volleyball. Yeah. And my parents told me about it, and I said, I don't know what the Paralympics are. I had no idea. Right. Right. My life had never involved adaptive sports, so I knew nothing about them. Right. And in talking to the coach, he explained to me that it was sitting volleyball, and immediately yeah. I was like, no, no, I play standing. Mm -hmm. That's my sport. I, right. mm -hmm. I'm not disabled. I don't, yeah. I don't play disabled sports. Thank you very much, but no thank you. And he, mm -hmm. he encouraged me over and over, begged me to come. And so I finally did, and I wanted to see what it was all about. Mm -hmm. So we went out to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, and I walked into the gym, and I saw people sitting on the ground with a volleyball net lower. Mm -hmm. The base of the net was on the ground. And I was like, oh, this looks like volleyball, but nothing that I've seen before. Mm -hmm. And immediately I was taken by what the sport could be. Right. In those early days, we didn't really, um, it wasn't really volleyball the way that I was used to playing. Right. And so, but I knew that it was a sport that was challenging and much harder than standing volleyball because in sitting volleyball, you're sitting on the ground on your bottom and you have to move with your hands to get to the ball because you don't have your legs, okay. but you still have to get your hands up fast enough to play. So it's very athletic. So the speed, yes, yes. very much so, which mm -hmm. is a misconception about Mm. adaptive sports. People believe that it's a watered-down version of yeah. the regular able-bodied sport, mm. when in fact most adaptive sports are much harder Not if you've ever watched than able-bodied sports. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they are, yeah. And so with the net being lower, the speed of the game is so much faster because by the time the hitter contacts the ball, the person that's digging it has less time to react to the ball. There's less, right? less yeah. space for the yeah. ball to travel, yeah. not to mention that you have to pick your hands up from getting your body mm. to the ball and then move your hands Sounds up to play. Incredible. Yeah. It's addicting. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It was just immediately, it was something that I knew was going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And in deciding the rest of my life path with volleyball, I had the option to play college volleyball. But I knew that the four years at a D1 school would be taxing on my body, and mm -hmm. I wanted the rest of my body to be healthy. Right. Um, and so I wanted to be a part of the Paralympics, and I wanted to grow the sitting volleyball and the Paralympics in the U.S. and to help kids and people who might not know that sports could still be a part of their life and just to help them find the joy that I've found in sports. You've been in yes. four Paralympics? Yes, correct. And um, tell us. Sure. My first was in Athens in 2004. We mm -hmm. were new to the sitting volleyball world, um, and we came in, and we won bronze. We, we beat the teams that have been playing for decades. Wow. And we surprised the sitting volleyball world, and we took home a bronze. Amazing. And that was in Athens in 2004. In Beijing in 2008, we won a silver. We lost to China. We played um, the home team wow. in a stadium full of 8,000 plus people, and it was a phenomenal, mm -hmm. a phenomenal mm -hmm. experience. I have goosebumps wow. just listening it was, to this. It, I really do. Yes, <laughs> it, was it, it was amazing. Yeah. It made losing the gold much easier to be in mm -hmm. that kind of yeah. environment. Yeah. Um, in London, we also won silver, losing again to China. Mm -hmm. um, although it's a pretty medal, that one hurt a bit because yeah. it was tough losing to them the back nemesis. to back. Yes. I always yes. Yes. the <laughs> silver is the tougher the medal to yeah. receive. You walk out of a tournament losing, and yeah. that's never a good mm -hmm. feeling. At least yeah. with the bronze, you won at the end. Right. You're yeah. celebrating something. <laughs> right. um, and then in Rio uh, in 2016, we won our gold medal. That Beautiful. is unbelievable. Yes. And so heavy. So heavy, yes. <laughs> 
Wow. And <laughs> thankfully, yeah. we had our third time against China in the finals match. And, and this time, that was, we beat them that's in three. Amazing. We beat them good. Yay. And that <laughs> felt really good. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. And the cool thing about the, the gold medal for Rio is that for the hearing impaired athletes in the Paralympics, oh, they made yeah. a sound inside each yeah. medal. You want to do that? Yeah. yeah. And so oh, each medal cool. sounds different. Yeah. So. I only have the gold sound, right. but if yes. you found um, the silver and the bronze, they oh, all sound beautiful. different, that's so there's beautiful. a different tone, yes. Beautiful and, and then, of course, there's always Braille on the back. Yes. That's gorgeous. Well, yeah. How special yeah, is this? And, and thank yeah. you so much for representing our country yes. so well. So, uh, so proud. It is yeah. fantastic. Joining us now via Skype is the director of sitting volleyball, Bill Hameter. Welcome. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Great to have you with us, and uh, you know Laura's here with us. Hi, uh, Bill. So <laughs> Hello, Laura. Uh, so you're over in Oklahoma City? Correct. That's where our national training site is, is based here in Oklahoma City at the University of Central Oklahoma. That's Fantastic. great. Bill, what's the biggest obstacle for Paralympic athletes? Uh, probably the... Uh, amount of time that they have to train in relation to job, family, and those types of things, um, because they're usually not supported as well as some of our uh, Olympic counterparts. So it's difficult for them, you know, to have a livelihood working and training and trying to compete and those types of things. How do you do identify your athletes? Um, well, sometimes I call our sport development uh, director, Elliot, uh, Amlet's chaser, but um, <laughs> I, he, you know, finds different articles about people that have played sports and, um, you know, have run into some type of difficulty or something, and then he'll follow up with them. We also go to a lot of the uh, tournaments, kind of like with Laura, where she was found, uh, as, as we have so many female players that are playing the game that a large amount of uh, players with disabilities are playing the standing game. So we try to identify them there and then transition to the, to the floor for the sitting game. Other than that, we just try to find good athletes at like the amputee coalition events and things like that. I imagine it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of persuasion for you because you're introducing another option that maybe wasn't on someone's radar at all. Um, a, a, a lot of times it is, and we do approach some athletes that ultimately don't, you know, come to, to play with us. Um, you know, but I think once they get on the floor and play a little bit, it's kind of like Lauren described, they uh, just kind of fall in love with the speed of the game and the nuances of the discipline. And uh, it's a, we just call it a discipline just like any of the other, the, the indoor discipline or the beach discipline. So anybody can actually play. And I think, most people just fall in love with it, and most of these athletes do as well. It sounds so intense. It really does. <laughs> yeah. Bill, I've, on a real practical level, uh, I, I know there must be a concern about how do we sponsor the athletes in terms of funding uh, and what can be done, and how do we get the word out to help? Well, uh, I... As most people would know, some may not, uh, you know, we don't receive any funding on the Olympic or Paralympic side from our government like most countries do. Mm -hmm. So we have to depend on our U.S. Olympic Committee and on our national governing body, which for us is USA Volleyball, uh, for funding. And besides that, we have to just go out and try to fundraise. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, uh, you know, people would like to support, they can support through uh, – the U.S. Olympic Committee or uh, through USA Volleyball or certainly uh, get in touch with me or something like that and we can uh, give them some projects that we're working on, that type of a thing. Uh, Bill, you want to direct them to a website so uh, they could uh, maybe make a contribution? You bet. Uh, USAVolleyball.org. That's okay. easy. All right. <laughs> and we'll, we'll put it in yeah. our materials, too, for the show. All what right. a great cause. Right. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you being an advocate for the, uh, the women athletes in sitting uh, volleyball. And uh, we really thank you for your service to our country, too. Um, well, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. I would like to make one note for you. Sure. Laura probably wouldn't say it, but uh, there's very few uh, volleyball players on the Olympic or Paralympic side that have participated in four games 
and uh, she's actually working to go to her fifth games, and <laughs> wow. I believe she'll probably make the roster if she goes. <laughs> Wait, he so said he good. thinks. He <laughs> thinks. <laughs> Bill, Bill, he <laughs> thinks. I have to earn it, for sure. I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Okay. She'll be one of uh, only you know, one in the U.S. on the volleyball side that's ever been to five games. Wow. wow. So that's a huge honor. That's amazing. Fantastic. That's fabulous. Well, great spending time with you today, Bill. Uh, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back on Family Comes First, Going for Gold. Welcome back to Family Comes First. We are here with gold medal winner, Laura Webster, who plays volleyball for USA Sitting Volleyball. I, I liked hearing gold medal winner. That, it that sounds is, good, doesn't that it? Is, it does that is good. awesome. Yeah. And so you, you're, you're an athlete who's done incredible things, and I hear you're also raising a family. Yes, yes. How husband. is that? <laughs> it's great. It's fun. Yeah. It's busy. Tell us about your children, your husband. <laughs> your husband. My husband, Paul, and I, we have three kids. My daughter, Madeline, who's six and a half. My mm -hmm. son, Cole, who's four and a half. And then mm -hmm. our son, Kyle, who's two. Oh, that's a handful. Yeah. It is, but they're fun. So that's a challenge. It's a challenge to not be an Olympic gold medalist and have three kids. And, you know, <laughs> and so how do you juggle training and what, what does that I schedule you, you look like? I a little jealous. I'm so impressed. <laughs> I'm just so impressed. As a mom of, you know, a bunch of kids myself, it's like, I, you know, I'm trying to imagine training for a gold medal <laughs> Olympic sport. And, uh, you know, my husband is phenomenal. Mm. That he, helps. Yeah. he, when we met, um, I was a Paralympian mm -hmm. by that point. So I think he knew a little bit of what he was getting yeah. into. Yeah. Um, but we met on the volleyball court. His team was scrimmaging us. Oh. Um, and they came in to play us. Oh, cool. Did you beat him? Yeah. Did you oh, beat absolutely. him? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Of course we did. <laughs> of course we did. We don't talk about that too much. No. Yeah. Well, it's but, too late, yeah. <laughs> and so he's been along for the ride. Oh, we great. met in 2006, so before. Um, the la next three Paralympics. And so he has been there for every step oh, of that's it. that's great. Mm. And once we had kids, he knew it would be tough. Right. Um, although when I left for London, we only had one at the oh, time. Only one. <laughs> and only one. I was expecting our second at the time. Wow. Um, but when I left for Rio, we had three. So that was a big wow. a So big you won change. the gold medal with three kids. With three kids at home, right. yes. And he made it to the game. I know there was a little he bit did, of a... He did, barely. But he was there cheering us on. He didn't even get a chance to take a seat. He was so nervous. Oh. Um, but just having him there and having him there to celebrate something oh, that he was such amazing. a big part of. Mm. Without him, I wouldn't have been able to do this. Right. It just wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. And his support was amazing. It's phenomenal. I'm going to take you back to London. Mm -hmm. Was there a little surprise in London? <laughs> yes. I, um, <laughs> during our gold medal match, I was 20 weeks pregnant with our second. Wow. wow. Yes. And, I and it was a secret. It was a secret. It wasn't easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sure I love my teammates, and it was hard. Mm -hmm. But I knew if they knew that I was expecting that they would be tentative around me, and they wouldn't play full out. And I didn't want to burden them with that. Mm -hmm. That was for me to carry and for me to take care of, not for right. them. Their focus was to win gold right. and to be there to play the best that they could mm -hmm. and that we all could as a team. Yeah. And I did not want to be a factor in making somebody worried on the court. Um, and so that was the reason why I didn't share that. So, you know, you mentioned your teammates, and I, you know, I was curious. We, we mm. were talking before about mm. who plays with you yeah. and their stories. Their stories. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We have a lot of stories. Mm. Um, and that's something that's special and unique to the Paralympians is that all the Paralympians that are there have amazing stories of how they've gotten there and the things that they've overcome mm. to get to competing for their country. Um, on my team, over the 14 years that I've played, we have had um, athletes who, I've had teammates who were hit by a train, oh. run over by an airplane. Oh, an airplane. Um, yes, oh. run over by a lawnmower and um, a boat. Oh. And all of these phenomenal women have come back. Some were kids, some were adults when it happened. Wow. But yet they still found their way back into sports. Um, one of those women is still my current teammate and a friend mm -hmm. of mine. And it just, it shows what humans are capable of. Right. And it embodies the fact that 
even if something bad happens to you, that doesn't mean that life ends, nor does it mean that you can't go back to living the life that you were living beforehand. Right. And a lot of times, the opportunities that have opened up to a lot of my teammates were something that they never could have imagined if their illness or tragedy or mm -hmm. whatever didn't happen to them. Mm -hmm. I know that I would never wish my life on a different path. Mm -hmm. The cancer was an obstacle. It was horrible for my parents, and as a parent now, I just I apologize to them all the time because yeah. putting your parents right. through something like that very different yeah. experience very as a parent than as yes. you. Yes, yeah. but it's yeah. just yeah. for me, it was just it was what it was. It never yeah. really phased me, and now it seems like a lifetime ago. But watching your kid go through that, right. I Must couldn't imagine been. the heartache for them. Yeah. Um, but even with all of that, I never would be where I am right now without that. Yeah. And my life is truly blessed because of what I went through, and what we overcame as a family. And now what my family and I get to experience together and what my kids get to grow up seeing every day. Right. As normal. As like normal. They, you know, you're not mom right. gold medalist. You're just no, mom. <laughs> I am. And, and my prosthesis is not strange to them. So yeah. when their friends, when we're at the beach and their friends ask what happened, they're like, what do you, you know, what do you it's mean? just her leg. Yeah. And I love that. And yeah. I think that's the way it should be. And yeah. kids can teach us a lot about how to ask people questions about what's sure. happened to them or what they're facing because kids have no barriers. Whereas adults, we feel like we're being rude for asking questions. Yeah. Kids just want to know. They're curious. Time goes so quickly. I have one last question for sure. you, which is, what would you say to all the young girls out there who have a physical challenge? Mm -hmm. what, what, would, what would you like to say to them? Just to try. Mm. Try something. Life doesn't stop just because you're either too scared or too nervous or too hesitant or mm. whatever it may be that's holding you back. Mm. Mm. Just let go of it. Yeah. You embrace who you are. That is the one regret that I wish I could go back and change from being in high school is that I was always so nervous mm. about what people would think about me, as any kid is. Sure. Mm. But um, I just I wish I would have embraced who I was more and mm. been more upfront and more confident in who I was. And... Everybody has their own story, and the more that we share it and the more that we embrace our own story, the more people learn, and I think that they enjoy hearing that diversity that people have to offer, yeah. and especially for girls and young girls, just embrace who you are yeah. regardless. There's nothing you can do to change it, no. right. and being holding that burden on yourself, it's just it's wasted energy. Just yeah. have fun. Don't let anybody stop you from laughing and doing what you want to do because mm -hmm. in the end, that's what life is about. Well, seeing you, you'd be a phenomenal coach, a mentor. You're a phenomenal role model. Thank I mean, you. to all the, the young athletes, I'm not going to say young women, and I'm not going to say para-athletes, you know, to all athletes and young women out there, you are just an inspiration. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just hope to motivate. Thank you. For yes. sure. So thank you, you so know. much for being on our show. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a break right here on Family Comes First. Welcome back. Uh, we've been chatting with Laura Webster, who is proof that everyone can be active and participate in sports and, and create the life of their dreams if they choose to do so. I couldn't agree more. She's extraordinary. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, I just want to share this information with you, Victoria. Uh -huh. um, I find it incredible. Mm -hmm. The number of athletes participating in the Summer Paralympic Games was 400 athletes in Rome in 1960. Okay. All right, so there were 400 of them. In Rio in 2016, there were 4,350 wow. um, uh, uh, athletes in the Paralympics. That's amazing. And over 160 countries participating. It's phenomenal. So it's phenomenal. It's just amazing. And I hope it continues to grow and, and, you know, become more mainstream and have people aware that the athletic mindset 
is is not specific to a sport. It's not specific to a physical condition. It's just awesome. I, I as someone who doesn't have it, <laughs> you know, I can be <laughs> profoundly admiring of uh, of that mindset. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now we love to welcome uh, Father Anthony Staganelli, Father Thank Tony, you. our spiritual advisor. Well, thank you so much. It was awesome to see Exciting. Laura and to have that interaction with her. And, oh, my goodness, what an incredible, incredible woman. Yeah. The two things that just really stuck in my heart when she said, my life is blessed. Yeah. Imagine that. My life is blessed. Yeah. When others who face challenges in life, you know, struggled to find meaning and purpose and value and who they are and what they are, she never stopped believing that her life had a purpose that that never changed, mm -hmm. that her dream didn't change, her vocation didn't change because of the circumstances, yeah. and that she could pursue that dream, that vision, no matter what. Mm. Isn't that incredible? And to see that God who gives us that dream, God who places and plants that seed in our heart to say, this is who you are, and then to say, well, just embrace who you are. Mm -hmm. What an incredible mm -hmm. message she gave all young people, yes. all of us, yes. embrace who you are because that's where God is, and that is your vocation. That's who you are. That doesn't change no matter what the circumstances of your life happen to be. Yeah, and, and what she said about the fact that at 11, she was far more in touch with that and had clarity yeah. in terms of, and it was much harder on her parents, yeah. as you know we could understand, mm. yeah. but for her, she knew what she wanted. She knew the choice she wanted to make. She knew what she wanted to do with her life. But isn't um, that great that young people, yes. I think, could be in touch with, who they really are. Mm -hmm. If they, they could just maybe step aside from other people's expectations or what yeah. other people are saying to know who you are mm -hmm. and to embrace that mm -hmm. and to pursue it with. Uh, and then she had the uh, openness mm -hmm. to see this experience as an opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She <clears throat> sees the flow of other opportunities that have come out of her situation, right? Yeah, and sees that as a blessing. As a blessing, a blessing. Yeah. exactly. And her parents, without meeting them, must be extraordinary because, mm. despite the reservations of what you would want for your child, having the foresight of you know what comes next, dating this, that, or mm. the other thing, to still allow your 11-year-old daughter to make the choice that she made, I. I, I'm struck by how extraordinary parents that is as really a parent. Sure, because my yeah. parents wouldn't let me cross the street until I was 25. And many parents make <laughs> decisions for their children based on what mm -hmm. they think they know is yeah. best. Yeah. And right. yet she had a grasp on what she wanted, and she seemed very clear about it, you know, mm. all the way through. So to have parents that will give mm. that gift of choice to their child, yeah. they must be extraordinary they as are. well. So, yeah. <clears throat> you incredible. know, s some children just... They just have it. They have this mm -hmm. focus or they know what they want or they, they see their dreams in front of them mm -hmm. and say, I can achieve them. And uh, I think Laura was one of those kids who's, mm -hmm. who said, you know, I, I'm not going to let this affect me in any way. Yeah. I'm just going to keep going. And yet she going. was very honest mm -hmm. about her own insecurities, which yeah, I think, sure. you know, kids who watch her. And I, I hope she speaks to many kids because yes. I, could, I, I could see young people looking at her and saying, I, okay, I, I'm a little nervous, I'm a little scared, I don't know if I'm, you know, if I can do this. And hearing that she had those doubts too, and then sure. one medal after medal after medal is... Right. Uh, you just have to work through it, yeah. work through the doubts. Yeah. yeah. Incredible role model. Yeah. Exactly. Just incredible. And a beautiful person. Right. Beautiful yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful well, thank spirit. you so much, Father Tony. Well, thank you for inviting me and seeing these wonderful people you bring on this show. <laughs> it's been great. Yes. So um, USA, USA Volleyball and Paralympic athletes are great examples, as we've been discussing, of those who won't let physical challenges stop them from doing what they love. For a list of resources about the things we've talked about on this show and more information, please visit Vincent's law firm's website at vjrussolaw.com. Thanks to all our viewers for joining us. And remember, family truly does come first.